Reconciliation is probably the largest national project that Canada has embarked on since the building of the railways. I mean, it's of that huge right, and immense proportions, right? And it's designed to reset and restart and renew the, the relationship between Indigenous peoples and, and, and Canada. Right? What happened over the last uh, hundred and, and so years, right, is that the relationship, as the Cree would say, has gone awry. Something went wrong. And so reconciliation is intended to correct that, uh, that error. Right? Let me give you an example of, at least of, of how I see right, reconciliation, why I think it's so important. Right? In 1857, right, the government of Canada, right, in this case, uh, this was prior to the establishment of Canada, so uh, the governments of Upper Canada right, that passed the Graduate Civilization Act. And so what it was intended to do was to uh, transform Indians into European, right? And so when Canada became a, 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 a nation, right, then that project continued. And that project continued up until 1971. So for 114 years, right, the Canadian state used its full force, its full power to try to change indigenous peoples right, into Europeans. And it used a whole variety of means to do that. Right? It, it created Indian reserves and tried to isolate Indians. It tried to set tests uh, for uh, Indians to become Europeans right, through a process of, and set up the process of enfranchisement. It created probably one of the most uh, uh, well-known and infamous institutions, the Indian Residential School right, in Canada. Uh, which became the primary instrument for this transformation process. And uh, so for 114 years, right, Indians were subjected to this force of the state. And that ended in 1969 when the government uh, uh, tabled in the House of Commons uh, its uh, white paper on Indian policy. And the white paper was intended to uh, dissolve the Indian Act to transfer the responsibilities for Indians from the federal government to provinces to dissolve any reserves to uh, uh, interpret treaties very narrowly. Right? In, in effect, it, it was a policy of extinguishment uh, or termination, a policy that had been followed and, and attempted in the United States. There was a great deal of resistance right, to the tabling of that uh, position paper, and the position paper was withdrawn in 1971. And the Canadian government uh, then right, formally ended its attempt to transform Indians. It didn't quite know what to do, and over the next uh, uh, 20 years or so, followed a variety of different policies, which some would call uh, self-determination, self-government. And it wasn't until 1998, right, with the first uh, statement of reconciliation that we began to talk about reconciliation. Right? There have been some sort of things before, but they weren't labeled reconciliation. They weren't seen through the frame of reconciliation. And um, with the establishment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and its report in uh, December 2015, right, we've entered into a, an official period of reconciliation. And most people right, uh, don't have a good sense of, of what that means. Right? Most people you know, understand that something went wrong. Most people understand and see the consequences on Aboriginal people, Indigenous people, right? Indians, First Nations, Métis, Inuit, of, that, uh, of what I call the long assault. Right? I, I, I call that, that uh, from 1857 to 1971, the long assault, because it really was an assault. And so we see the effects of that on, on the incomes of Indigenous people, on the uh, health of Indigenous people, on the mental health of Indigenous people, right? And uh, so in, 19, uh, nine, in 2015, right, we began as a country to say, okay, now we've got to do something formally about this. And Trudeau committed to implementing 
all of the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So most Canadians don't know what reconciliation is, right? I mean, it's this huge project that doesn't have much definition, right? And so what I've been trying to do is trying to think about what are the components of reconciliation. And what I think, when I think about uh, reconciliation and try to explain it, I say that it's comprised of four distinct but overlapping elements. Right? The first one is what I call harmony. Right? That is focused upon the relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. Right? So it focuses upon improving that relationship. The second one is what I call equity, or what the public policymakers call closing the gap. That is improving uh, incomes, improving health, right, improving uh, education, right, improving housing, improving water quality, right, all of those sort of quality of life things, right. The third one is what I call uh, restoration and, and, uh, and resurgence, and that is a restoration of jurisdiction over indigenous lands and, and resources, right, including uh, water, right, so it's a way in which one can then begin to develop self-governments, right, row self-governments. It's also a way in which one begins to uh, focus upon self-determination, support self-determination in urban environments. And the last one is what I call a, a critical conversation about Canada. Right? Because while we're doing all that, right, then we need also to think about what adjustments do we need to make in order to ensure that these things take, right? Ensure that Indigenous people are built into the body politic, right? And, uh, in very significant substantive ways, right? And the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People had a vision of Canada, right? They said Canada should consist of, uh, of the, the federal of the federal government, right? Of provinces, of uh, territories, and uh, of Aboriginal nations, right? And, and so we should have a third level government, right? That would comprise Aboriginal governments. And so there's a, a conversation, right, that needs to occur about how Canada is structured and how Canada is governed and what place uh, average people play within it. So it's a way of trying to talk about reconciliation so that people can find a place to work within it. The other part of reconciliation that most people don't, uh, I think, think about is the length of time, right? It's this is the work of generations. Right? It's taken, I'll say, 114 years to get here, which is about seven generations or so. And Murray Sinclair says it's going to take seven generations to, to get out of it. Right? So it's a long-term process. Right? It's going to take right, at least okay, another 100 years or so. And you know, people also think that there ought to be an end point. Right. Well, there isn't an end point, right? It's going to be a constant conversation. I mean, that's the nature of Canada, right? Our relationships are changed, right? We have to begin to rejuggle things based upon our new understandings, right? And so as we move forward in this process of reconciliation, right, we're always going to be thinking about what more can be done, right? And sometimes there's going to be large things, sometimes there's going to be small things, but there's always going to be more to be done.